folks. Welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. I am your host, Pat. Uh, right now, we're listening to Fetus. On this, they're known as uh, Scraping Fetus Off the Wheel. They were also known as Fetus Uber Frisco, Fetus Under Glass, and lots of other uh, names involving the word fetus <laughs> since the mid-80s, which is around the time this came out. It's an uh, Australian guy who lives in New York, lived in New York at least for the majority of his recording career, named J.G. Thurwell. Um, more people may be familiar with his work than know it. He did a lot of uh, themes for TV shows, including The Venture Brothers and MTV Sports back in the 90s. Um, I, I, there's a ton more, but they I don't know off the top of my head. Really uh, original industrial music. Not similar at all to any of the other heavy hitters like the Ministry or Skinny Puppy. Very odd, uh, influenced by Americana pop culture kind of stuff from the like 20s and 30s through the 60s kind of I think kind of talking out of my ass out of that but there's a lot more stuff going on than just dark abrasive shit like a lot of uh, popular industrial bands check them out it sounds like something you'd be into um, going back into my record collection here for this update we're in the seas we left off with cloven hoof last time um, so we'll get into some Cox Bar. got some Cox Bar records here this is England Belongs to Me, god-awful layout there on Tang Records. This is a singles collection. Um, Cox Bar were one of the greats as far as British punk goes. Kind of predated the Sex Pistols from what I read um, by a year or two, although they weren't really punk then, they were kind of more of a, a glam kind of band, kind of along the lines of Sweet and stuff like that. They toured with the Faces towards the end of their career. This is. Um, this is a great singles collection that has all their hits. Um, Price Too High to Pay, Run With The Blind, Live Cover of White Riot by The Clash, The Song Running Riot, Trouble on the Terraces, Sister Susie and What You Gonna Do About It. I think that's from the glam era. What You Gonna Do About It's a faces cover, small faces cover. Awesome stuff. Then I have their, uh, their debut LP here, Shock Troops. This was re-released on Pirates Press. Fantastic, fantastic punk record. Very melodic and uh, sing-along-y, but also incredibly gritty and driving and pissed. You know, if you're looking to explore quote-unquote street punk, melodic punk, oi kind of type of shit, this is a great place to start. The, uh, the label, Pirates Press, who farm out their services to smaller labels and other labels for pressing, did this themselves and they did a bang up job with it. Gorgeous fucking vinyl there. The Cox Bar logo is embossed here, you can't really tell, but it is. Take my word for it. It's great. Great album. This came out years and years later. Guilty as charged. Um, not sure the year when this debuted, doesn't say on it. Um, it must have been no later than 1994, so somewhere between the late 80s and 1994. I just know that because there's the Boston punk band The Trouble named themselves after the song Bird Trouble and got it wrong. They thought they were singing The Trouble in the chorus, and they're singing Bird Trouble in the chorus. Little known fact, little known fun fact for you, but um, fucking great songs on here. A lot, little bit more uh, brighter, up-tempo, faster, pogo-y. Um, nonetheless more just as uh, anthemic as the first one and we got Cold Sweat Blinded this is a band that uh, I loved in the mid 2000s around about a decade ago coming up on it they were uh, a hardcore band from Seattle if I'm not mistaken their singer went on to move to Austin Texas and did a band called with Repercussions the Repercussions were a lot more straightforward kind of fast hardcore influenced by Discharge and stuff like that, Swedish hardcore. Cold Sweat were incredibly noisy, discordant, desperate sounding hardcore. Um, not really uh, metalcore or anything like that. They were far more leaning towards My War Era, Black Flag, Void, um, early Rorschach, stuff that was noisy. Uh, the execution of the music was incredibly dead on and, and tight rhythmically, but the guitars, the guitar lines were 
kind of squishy, you know, there was a, a loose jazziness to the guitar work. There's a lot of kind of approaching noise elements on this where the songs kind of fall apart. Not too different from what Void was doing or maybe Septic Death or something like that. The band was just incredible. This came out on Manic Ride Records sometime in the mid to late 2000s, I think 2007 or something like that. Center labels for you there, just black vinyl. There's the insert. <coughs> Axed up hand with white paint there, baseball bat. It's intimidating shit. And this is Severed Ties, which is their debut, I believe. I think this one came first. It certainly sounds like it came first. It's a lot more, uh, it's a lot less dirgy than the parts on there that are slower. This is a lot more discordant, fast kind of stuff, almost kind of breaching into sort of power violence territory. Um, over in a hot minute, but man, what a great hardcore record. So if you like any of the aforementioned bands I mentioned, you know, um, definitely give these guys a listen. They were one of the best of this era. And I got this <clears throat> Colored Balls Ball Power Gatefold reissue. This is an Australian band who I've discussed before. My Rock and Roll Summer video talked about them a bit. Um, great rock and roll from Australia kind of combined uh, pub glam sort of stuff, fair amount of uh, psychedelia, and there's a few songs on this that are just ass-kicking fast, fast rock and roll, like Mama Don't Get Me Wrong and Won't You Make Up Your Mind. Won't You Make Up Your Mind is a minute and a half long, and it's almost like a proto-hardcore punk song, um, like Chuck Berry on Crystal Meth, bashing you over the head, fucking great shit. There's a combat, bo combat bone. <laughs> Combat Zone LP here for you. This is part of that whole Boston movement that I've mentioned several times. Uh, bands from Boston that took a lot of inspiration from the early 80s, kind of worshipping at the altar of uh, This Is Boston, Not L.A. Comp stuff, early Tang records, early Exclaim records, good amount of Discharge and some Oi in there as well, gruff vocals, chorus-oriented, Blitzkrieg, steamrolling fucking hardcore stuff not the best band out of all these bands that popped up out of Boston like I said that honor goes to Boston Strangler but Combat Zone are damn good and this came out on side 2 local label there um, why not show off the center labels there cool looking center labels also on black we got the Complications here, self-titled LP. This came out on Feral Ward, which was Yannick from uh, Tragedy's label. Feral Ward always had really nice packaging. And the rounded corners on the printed inner sleeve and stuff like that. Black vinyl again. This is uh, great music. This band came out of the ashes of a band called Born Dead Icons. Born Dead Icons were um, this really dark, desperate sounding, um, kind of mid-paced, rock and roll driven, crust punk band from Montreal. And they drew a lot of influence heavily from Amoebix's kind of more mid-paced stuff with Motorhead's kind of more mid-paced stuff. Amoebix was already influenced by Motorhead, so you can figure out the ratio there. <laughs> that was Born Dead Icons. Complications wove in a little bit more, um, I don't know, kind of garage, gloominess, maybe some death rock. They got a bit more melodic and softened things up. There was a persistent kind of uh, Wipers influence as well on the music. It's a great record, super underrated. I never really hear anybody talking about it these days, but complications were great. And we got this uh, Convict record. Uh, just bought this because of the cover. Saw that it was on Roadrunner a few years ago. Um, pretty weak heavy metal, to be honest. Not not my thing. Um, John from Bip Bop Boom, I believe this told, talked about how the, this is a uh, joke band or just a studio project for some kind of cash grab. He did his whole um, a whole video on on like made up bands, joke bands, stuff like that. He talked about Pile Driver, who were great, and a bunch of others. Uh, Exorcist. This is uh, a bad example of that sort of thing coming together. Um, it's on Cobra Records, which I think. Pile Driver was on, and Roadrunner. 
Nice old Roadrunner logo there. Yeah, interesting artifact for my collection, but um, music's pretty terrible in my opinion. Uh, what's not terrible is Convulse's World Without God. This is a reissue. Came out in 2013. This is a special limited MDF 2013 on Gruesome Gray. I picked it up at the Maryland Death Fest that year. And there's the Gruesome Gray for you. Finished death metal classic. You know, if you're into death metal, if you like the older death metal stuff from the 90s, you should know this bad boy. Com incredibly dark stuff. Gloomy. Dripping with the uh, atmosphere. Um, just crushing. I liked how the Finnish bands kind of, some of them, at least the more cleanly produced ones, kind of felt like American death metal just as much as death metal from other parts of Scandinavia. But I always love the cover, cover painting for this too. It's great. Got Sam Cooke live at the Miami Club. Sorry, the Harlem Square Club, which was in Miami. This is one of my favorite live records of all time. It's got a lot of Sam's best known songs, Chain Yang, Cupid, etc. Having a party is closed out with, but it's got a <clears throat> this great, um, just crackling with energy, raw live sound that feels almost kind of punk to me in a way. This was just an RCA reissue. There's a little forward on the back from Rod Stewart talking about how it was one of his favorite records. Nice history there. Some reading you can do about the gig that happened and stuff like that. This is a greatest hits record. You know, a little cheapy pickup. A lot of standards on this. Danny Boy's on this. God Bless the Child. Uh, Old Man River. But you got You Send Me on here, which is one of my favorite songs. Uh, everybody loves the Cha Cha Cha. Too true. Gotta have some Sam Cooke in the collection, man. Gotta. Got the Alice Cooper Easy Action, which I think is his first. I'm not like Captain Knowledgeable about Alice Cooper, but as far as I know, it's his first. This is just a nice bare bones repress on Warner. Classic Warner Center labels there. Black vinyl. Um, Refrigerator Heaven is probably my favorite track on here. This is a little bit more glammy, I think, than the sort of more hard rocky, campy vaudeville stuff that he did later. Speaking of which, I also have a copy of Billion Dollar Babies here. Elected is the jam. The music video for that is really something. There's a guy in a bird costume flapping around. It's kind of a party non copy, but it plays fine. Um, yeah, you know, not a huge Alice Cooper nut, but I definitely like this one a lot. Um, most of the 70s stuff is pretty great, really. I wouldn't mind having a few more from his golden era. Billion Dollar Babies, No More Mr. Nice Guy, famously covered by Megadeth on the Shocker soundtrack. And I got a couple of different versions of COC's Eye for an Eye. Now, this is one of my favorite records of all time, and I normally don't collect multiple pressings, but I had this beat to shit copy. This is on their the original version of this was released on uh, No Core Records. I don't know what pressing this is, but it got re-released on Toxic Shock, then again on Metal Blade, Caroline, I think. Um, this is the original cover art. There is a variant of this with, with this in negative, with the guy's face in black and the background in white. But yeah, great hardcore punk. Um, some similarities to Black Flag, a la Damaged. Um, a lot of similarities to a lot of the, the hardcore from DC at the time. Even back then, I feel like they had a little bit of a Sabbath influence creeping in. Some of the riffs are kind of like half-stolen Sabbath riffs like that. Um, cover of Green Man Alishi, not credited on the jacket. Fleetwood Mac, By Way of Judas Priest. Then, I have a Toxic Shock pressing of this. Great stuff. The iconic Toxic Skull, 
pretty much saw this everywhere in the late 80s into the 90s. I think a lot of people that I knew of in high school and through skateboarding and stuff had this drawn all over the place, maybe not knowing who the band was. It was one of those uh, mascots that kind of transcended any knowledge of the music. There was even like this crappy order form jewelry company that had ads back in Thrasher and Metal Maniacs and Metal Edge in the, in the 90s, late 80s that, you know, sold along with like Ozzy Horns and the Slayer swords and stuff, they had this for sale. And uh, I know for a fact that the tattoo, this tattoo artist guy, the artist who designed the skull, never got any residuals or anything from the band. And he's pretty pissed about it apparently, but a friend of mine down in North Carolina actually coerced him into tattooing the original mascot on him. So that must be pretty cool to actually have the COC skull from the guy who designed it. But yeah, fantastic record. Somewhere in my top 100 of all time is the insert there. I love the, the art. This weird priest guy here. Just the lyrics on the other side. And right after that, they did six songs with Mike singing. This was after they lost the vocalist Eric Ike, who recently just passed away. R.I.P. Eric and went to a three-piece. Um, the bulk of this, pretty much all of this, except for I think one song, is all reworked versions of songs from Eye for an Eye. Done up much tighter and faster, uh, gaining sort of a speed metal bent, beginning of them kind of becoming a crossover band. And it's kind of cool, the photo negative. Um, you'll note that Mike Dean, the bassist there, has a St. Vitus sticker. It's kind of uh, a shadow of what was to come with what they did in the 90s, I feel. Um, they've always, they were always fans of like the sludgy, sabbath stuff, and that was actually pretty rare back then. A lot of people hated St. Vitus, from what I read. Interviews with St. Vitus about them getting booed off stage and playing with SST bands and stuff like that. These are a little out of, out of sorts, but uh, everything's been shelled. Uh, those are the center labels, Caroline Records. Then, The Great Animosity. Um, two different recording sessions, Side A and Side B. It's one of those records where people have a lot of debates, like, hey, Side B is better, Side A is better, you know, that kind of thing. Kind of like Black Flag's My War. Um, I like both. Um, sometimes I, I really lean towards Side 2, however. Intervention, um, the riff on that, that weird kind of swarm of bees kind of riff on Intervention. Kiss of Death, which is like a a rockin', um, just kind of kick-ass kind of rock and roll riff song about cops. Um, the, the vocals on side B have a certain amount of effect and distortion on them that makes them sound really crazy and manic. But yeah, this record fucking rules. Puss had cover art. Uh, Simon Bob Howdy, I think his name is, the guy who sings on the next record, did the artwork on the back there, but the tarot cards and, you know, little demons and stuff. This looks like some Ralph Bakshi shit. I fucking got it, you know, you can't can't screw with the classics, and this is definitely one of them. This came out on Death Records, a subsidiary of Metal Blade that, like Combat Core, put out a lot of the, the hardcore kind of stuff from Metal Blade. And then the last thing they did before an, a hiatus and reforming for Blind was Technocracy. Um, a lot of people find this to be their least favorite thrash era COC record. I think it's really good. Um, most of the complaints are about the vocals. Uh, Simon Bob there. This dude. Uh, they are a little weak in comparison to Mike Dean's and Eric's, but uh, they're still good. You know, he sang for a band called The Ugly Americans that were a little bit more like a straight-up hardcore punk band before this. And, um, I don't know, they're fine. There's a reissue of this that came out on CD and cassette only. I don't think it's available on vinyl, but the reissue has four bonus songs from another session. A couple of songs from this and a couple of songs from Animosity redone and on that session Mike Dean sings and that's some of my favorite COC material that session is just ripping blazing fast stuff after that I got some Elvis Costello
kind of shamefully the only Elvis Costello record that I owned, Armed Forces. But if you're going to own an Elvis Costello record, I think this should be the one. Mainly because it's got What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. The last update where I went through the record collection, I talked about how Curtis Mayfield's We Gotta Have Peace is one of my favorite songs. So I think, uh, I, think I know what that says about me. Fucking hippie. But cool printed inner sleeve. Elvis hanging over a pool there, or diving in, floating, levitating. He's a magic man. But yeah, there's some jams on here. The, I think he's an underrated lyricist compared with a lot of other types from his uh, generation, like Bruce, Bruce Springsteen and stuff. Uh, Oliver's Army is a great song, lyrically. Goon Squad, Two Little Hitlers. Um, it's not on this record, but the song Watching the Detectives is about as creepy and morbid as it gets outside the realms of metal and stuff like that. Scope that out. Then we got this Coven reissue. Destroys Minds and Reaps Souls. Uh, it was originally on a label called Dunwich Productions. came out in 1970. And this is a Karma Records, who I've never heard of. Um, there's a nude lady on an altar in the gatefold, so I'm going to leave that closed because I don't want this to get taken down. But those are the center labels for you. Um, these guys were, Guys and Gal were the original occult rock band. If you're not aware, probably the first band that open re openly referenced the occult. There's all kinds of uh, sigils and what have you. There, I've heard vocal comparisons from my parents who were, you know, around in the 60s that the vocalist Jinx Dawson sounds like Grace Slick, but I can't verify that because I'm not familiar with a lot of that stuff from that era. Um, great driving rock and roll with a psych slight psychedelic edge to it. Um, there's a song called Black Sabbath, predating, not predating the band, but around the same time the band was starting. Uh, White Witch of Rose Hall is a jammer, that's a real up-tempo. There's some great, like, organs and stuff on this. Wicked Woman is also, is also a, a hot, hot pick from this. But yeah, there's a 13-minute long Satanic Mass song, which to me gets kind of boring, but you can see why, you know, this band was influential, and when, uh, all those bands came along later, Jack Stoth and, uh, I'm trying to remember. All those occult rock bands, you can see why a lot of them drew inspiration from Coven. Great stuff. Then, to close things out on a bang, a big old nuclear bang, Chromag's Age of Quarrel. This is a GWR pressing, European press. It does have the uh, anti-drug Roadrunner thing there, so it looks like a split joint effort. Black vinyl. Pretty simple center labels there. Age of Quarrel. Um, this was an influential record when it dropped. And then I feel like it kind of, during the 90s and 2000s, kind of faded out of the public eye for a while. Um, especially in the 90s when hardcore, at least the, along the lines of New York and, and straight edge kind of hardcore, got really metallic and chuggy and slow. A lot of people weren't interested in the fast stuff that was more punk and spirit. Um, and I think interest in this band has experienced a great renaissance probably since the early 2000s when bands like American Nightmare started getting big. Um, it's on, also on Rock Hotel Records, which was uh, the manager who is a renowned scumbag's uh, imprint. And the Rock Hotel put out like Leeway and Murphy's Law and stuff like that. Musically, um, heavily influenced by the Bad Brains and Motorhead and Black Sabbath but kind of creating their own beast out of those disparate influences. The bass playing is unparalleled. You can definitely see that uh, Harley loves Lemmy, Lemmy's bass playing. He also quoted uh, Venom as an influence too, believe it or not. But this is the insert. On certain versions of this, I think US pressings and stuff, it was, uh, it was definitely censored. There was a big bar that just said censored across it. And it's this mushroom cloud with a bunch of bad stuff going on in it. There's a junky punk rocker there. There's a guy killing, uh, slaughtering a cow. They were vegetarians. There's pit bull fighting going on. And uh, right here, there's a couple of abortion doctors throwing a fetus in what appears to be a waste paper basket. And I mean, I don't know. I know it was the 80s, but I would think that would be some sort of like sterile receptacle and not something that you like 
throw your tissues away in. I don't know. Anyway, but fantastic, fantastic record. It's gotten its just due, and everybody worships it. Even a lot of people that don't like harder edge New York hardcore still regard this as a classic. Discharge was a big influence on these guys, too, I should mention. Just a relentless fucking record. Um, a lot of people prefer the demo, which is pretty much all the same songs. It's a little bit more raw. Um, I go back and forth between the two. John Joseph recorded this while he had a cold or something, I think. The vocals are a little, I guess, by his standards, a little low energy and could be better, but I think they sound great. Awesome stuff. Then they lost John. You can read about all the drama in John's book, Harley's book, all the internet beef that's gone on for years. It's a, it's a whole sordid tale. I won't get into it. Um, but afterwards, they put out Best Wishes, which to me is a damn fine crossover record. It's a little bit of a divisive topic. Some people really like it. Some people kind of like it. A lot of people hate it. Um, the, the blueprint, the basic DNA of Age of Quarrel is definitely strong on this. They just uh, beefed out the songs, made them longer. The musicianship's a bit tighter. There's more palm muting, kind of speed metal picking styles and solos and stuff on it. Um, Still reality-based lyrics, Harley sings, um, the vocals are where people usually kind of are divided. I like them fine. The delivery's not that different from John Joseph, I don't think, but there's more of a kind of a, a Hetfield aping, yeah, yeah, kind of thing, and it gets a little, gets a little silly in points, but um, I definitely dig the shit out of this record, and I think it's a successful melding of um, what was going on in underground New York hardcore with speed metal, much in the way that Cause for Alarm by Agnostic Front was, except they don't really, these two records by AF and Chromags don't sound alike, but they combine their original sounds with what was going on in speed and thrash metal really well, in my opinion, at the time. So that's it. Um, sorry for being a little, a little quiet and not usually, not as animated as I usually am, but... It's uh, like 5 in the morning, I woke up and couldn't fall back asleep because, as I've mentioned, my sleep schedule is fucked up and I'm just trying not to try not to wake up the family. So I'm enjoying uh, scraping fetus off the wheel at a safe level, which I don't recommend you do because the band needs to be blasted. Um, that's it, man. I'll be back probably in a day or two with a review. Hopefully, time permitting. All right.